Hi, I'm Jean Schumacher. I am founder of The Weight Loss Advantage. It is the advantage you're looking for if you're choosing to lose weight. So you can visit my website at www.weightlossadvantage.co. And I am here tonight. I have got Dr. Greg Fitzgerald, who is the founder and principal for the Health for Life Center. And he's been in practice since 1983. He is a registered osteopath, a chiropractor, a naturopath. And his website is healthforlife.com.au, as in Australia, like down under, way down under. And his lovely bride is here also with us. She is a massage therapist. And together, Greg and Dawn, who is a Jill of all trades, and she and they both run a variety of seminars. And their most recent has been 21 Days to Transform Health. So thank you so much, both of you, for being here tonight. Our pleasure, Jane. Pleasure, Jane. Our pleasure. Well, I have lots of questions <laughs> because that's what I do. I, I ask questions. So first of all, both of you, did you go both grow up plant-based? Was your family plant-based? When you met, were you plant-based or did you convert? Well, I'll go first. I wasn't raised plant-based. I was raised just a conventional uh, in a conventional family. So no, my parents were meat eaters, you know, milk drinkers, alcohol imbibers, cigarette smokers. No, not at all. My background was not that I, at all. And uh, Dawn? Same, Jean. I came from a very conventional background also. Uh, my parents really had no idea about health and, and how to raise a family healthily. So, yeah, so we, the same as Greg, I was brought up on a very conventional diet. And I guess through, as I became a teenager, I became more aware. I guess it was image first, and therefore I, I embarked on fitness. I was right in, in, into training and fitness. And through that, I guess I became more interested in the health side of things, which is basically when I met Greg. So when did you guys go plant-based? Well, it's been a gradual thing, really. When we first met, you wouldn't say we were anywhere near vegan. Of course, we still had some animal protein when we first met 34 years ago. But our diets were still predominantly plant-based then. You know, we still had copious quantities of vegetables and fruits and minimal quantities of uh, animal protein. But over the years, the animal protein has receded and the vegetables and plant-based foods have increased to the stage we're at now. So it's been a gradual evolution like a lot of people, you know. Uh, we didn't have a health crisis that led us to becoming more plant-based. It was more just an intellectual decision mm -hmm. and learning about the evidence. And it was compelling. It's true. When you start to look at the, the vast quantity, and especially now more so than ever. But how did you get connected? I mean, I know you've been with the NHA for a while. How did you connect, get connected with that? Well, when I was at college, I was very lucky to have met Dr. Alec Burton, who was the Dean of Osteopathy at my college. And he impressed me enormously with his knowledge, his erudition. You know, he was just a, a wonderful person and, and so knowledgeable. And I then came upon this concept called natural hygiene. So I started reading. I got a little book, which I showed at the NHA conference called The Greatest Health Discovery. I read that from cover to back. I read it about every four or five years now. I go through it. It's, it's a fantastic little book, and that changed my life. So I then became a member of the NHA. I did that for 10 years and qualified as a life member. And we went to our first conference in 1988. And then we followed that up with another conference in 1989, where we had the privilege of meeting and talking to the greats of the hygiene movement, like Keki Sidwa and you know, who else was there then? Of course, Virginia Vetrano, Alec Burton, Frank, uh, Frank Sabatino. Yeah, we had some great times in those uh, late 80s. Terrific. And then we had children. We couldn't get over anymore. And that sidelined us for a while. <laughs> As they do. As they do. Absolutely. So that was my introduction to natural hygiene and to the NHA, which was then called, you know, the American Natural Hygiene Society. So you mentioned on your website you're running the, and I don't know if I'm saying this, Cronula? 
Cronulla. Cronulla College of Natural Therapies. What is this? Did you start your own college? Yeah. Back in when we first met, I had a dream to start teaching people back in the mid 80s, teaching people the basics of health, you know, including fasting and all of the biological needs, which we emphasize in natural hygiene, you know, nutrition, fasting, uh, a low animal protein diet at that time, because I, 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 um, I wasn't vegan at all. But uh, yeah, so we taught people, we ran seminars, we ran classes, we, re we ran courses for many, many years from 1984. And we called that the Cronulla College of Natural Therapies where people would come and I would lecture and also employ other people to lecture who had similar views to us. Wow, that's awesome. It's, mm. it's nice when you start to see people that have a dream and do it, you know? Yeah, that's right. It well, is when, I met, when I met Greg, he told me of his dream on our first date. And we, he said, look, I just want to take you around the corner to where this vacant building is. And this is what I plan to do. And it was just concrete on the floor. There was nothing there. And he said, this is my dream. And he told me about the college that he wanted to create and the courses that he wanted to run. And, you know, that's going back in 1984. And that's exactly what happened. What, what he saw in his mind was, was what was created. That's well, kind of like... created twice, Jean. You know, everything's created twice. The desk that I'm sitting on was once created in the mind of the inventor. And then it became second creation in the actual fulfilment of the dream. And so you know, these things do have two lives, the mental I, and the manifestation physically. There's a movie, I don't know if you've seen it, called The Secret? Yeah, of course, yes. That's a few years old now. Yeah. Well, that's Same kind of like what it is. Thing. Right. Mm -hmm. You were already doing it before the movie long came out. So oh, you were that already... was nothing new. The Secret was nothing new. You know, that, that's based on wisdom that's been known for so long, you know, even in biblical terms. So there's very little new in the universe. Well, I must have skipped that one through my, my education days because the, the secret when it came out was new to me. So, but that it is, it's very, it's had a very profound impact on me. And, oh, okay. you know, and it's, and I start visualizing and seeing things and, and creating things now and they start to somehow happen. And so anyway, and well, the, just story like you. Goes, uh, uh, yeah, the story about Walt Disney is terrific. You know, Walt started up Disneyland in 1955, but he wanted something even bigger. And so his dream was to put in a Disney world on the other side of the States. And so he worked to get the Disney world up and running, but tragically he passed away prior to its opening. But on the opening day, Mrs. Disney was on stage and the, and the CEO of Disneyland was on the stage. And he said, it's a pity that Walt did not see Disney World. And she interrupted him and said, I beg your pardon. Of course he saw it. He saw it long before you did. It's true. And I grew up watching that on every Sunday night, watching Walt's vision unfold. And mm -hmm. it's true. You know, you're, you're so right. Don, what benefits have you seen being, as a woman, being plant-based? Well, when I first met Greg, I thought I was on a pretty good thing. But at that stage, I was still having a bit of dairy in my diet and probably too many processed foods on top of having a lot of fruits and vegetables. So I guess the more I educated myself, the more I read, I realised that those things really, I had to reduce those things in my diet. So the more I increased my diet to plant-based and I just felt that my joints felt better. I felt that my, probably my respiratory system felt a bit better because I was prone to getting lots of colds and flus and, and way back when I first met Greg, due to, you know, really pushing myself, I developed pneumonia. And after having, going on a 17 day fast and changing my diet from there on, I really noticed a lot of improvements I didn't get the colds, the flus, my joints felt better. But it wasn't just the food. It was also implementing other things like resting more, 
not pushing myself as hard because I used to push myself too hard with exercise and work. So, you know, it just takes time. It takes a lot of time to work out what's best for you and it's an ongoing thing and even to this day we're constantly refining what we do, fine-tuning what we do and, you know, as we, as we age, we change. And so sometimes we have to, you know, modify things a little bit more as we go along with food and lifestyle habits. Absolutely. Did you see anything like differences? Like were you already plant-based like when you gave birth or an impact on your periods or, you know, menopause, things like that? Have you seen? Well, we've got three children from 28, 26 and now 21. So it was a while ago when I gave birth. I would Were you say plant based then? I was plant. I was pretty, yeah. I was plant based then, and I wouldn't say I had easy births. I'd love to say I was able to just you know birth quite easily, but that didn't happen. But I just think that's one of those things with periods. I always had quite painful periods, but I also believe that that was due to other lifestyle habits because I know when I sort of cut back on my exercise and stress levels at work I had my periods were certainly easier so diet dietary related I can't really say that that had an effect because I was pretty consistent with a plant-based diet now through menopause uh, the menopausal symptoms that the only menopausal symptoms I suffer is a, is a bit of flushing so um, I don't have the severe menopausal symptoms that some of our patients do when they come in I'm very grateful but I do put that down to better management from being aware and, and also modifying my lifestyle habits. I don't push myself with exercise as hard as I used to. And I think that's really helped. Although I'd, I'd love to completely get rid of the flushes. That would be very nice. But I think it's just a matter of riding through that. And right. yeah, I don't know whether there's any easy answer to that one, Jean. <laughs> Okay. Never hurts to ask, but have you noticed by any chance, like I know in Dawn, that, like in the United States, I've seen like and heard from friends that children are starting their menstrual cycles at a much earlier age. Have you seen that in Australia? Of course. Um, that's probably an answer, a question for you, Greg. Of course. Yes. But this is not just uh, in Australia and America. It's right around the Western world. Yeah. where you've got a, a, a lowering at, at the age of monarchy, you know. And this is a risk factor for, you know, estrogen-dependent cancers and things like this because you're exposing the body to a longer period of estrogen. Same as nulliparous women, women who don't have children have an increased risk of breast cancer because they have more periods because they don't stop having a period when they don't get pregnant. So they have more exposure to estrogens throughout their lives on a conventional diet, this is a high risk factor. So we're seeing that all around the world, you know, younger and younger ages where they're getting their periods, the girls. And they're also getting, young boys are getting gynecomastia, which is growing breasts. And this is happening at the age of eight, nine, 10 now. So we're getting the estrogenification, the people are getting too much estrogens through things, you know, in the Western world, and it's having a bad effect on their health. It's true. And things like toxins, I'm very big on toxins. And you see things like parabens. Yeah. I mean, and I mean that has a huge impact because it's bioaccumulative and your body thinks, but it's not. It's, it thinks it's estrogen. Mm. So, you know, you're starting to see this accumulation effect and it's horrific. And, and that's just one of the chemicals. There's only like over like 10,000 chemicals that's being used in the personal care products. And it's just absolutely horrific. And I remember, I don't know if you had seen, there's a EWG, the Environmental Working Group. Yeah. They've done a, a body burden test on teenagers. And on average, there was some, something like 268 chemicals that were in their mm. bloodstream. You know. Well, that's right. That's just wrong. I mean, exactly. It's an it's, uh, it's appalling situation when most of these chemicals aren't properly tested either. And, and so you've got this thing with the EWG, when they came out in 2001, and they proved conclusively that the body did store toxins. It did store them, which they referred to, as you said rightly, the body bird. And that was the first validation of the hygiene philosophy and the hygiene premise of toxemia. 
you know, prior to that, medical profession laughed at the concept of toxemia as a theory of disease. But th then it was validated in 2001 by the Environmental Working Group. And you're starting to see, I think, the impact of this. And I've, I've been in the classroom for 35 years, and I see this daily in the classroom, the yeah. impact of it. And, you know, I've been looking for a long time. Is it, you know, the toxins? Is it the food? Is it the processed food? You know, and, and uh, the environment? I mean, because in just like two generations, you can't see that much change. But you have kids that have such different abilities on how they can think in terms of cognitive development. It's, it's, it's awful. I mean, they have such learning problems, and I see it daily. I don't teach the way I did 25 years ago because they can't handle it. No. I mean, in terms of, of how I teach and, and expecting them to understand, you know, to be able to read a science textbook and absorb it a lot on their own, they can't do that now. And well, you know, it should be no surprise, though, Jean, that we're getting a lot of mental issues and um, developmental problems with children. It should be no surprise because... Wouldn't it be a disconnect if the society in which we live was besieged by physical problems from the neck down? You know, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, autoimmune diseases. If these are, were rampant, which they are rampant, but we're all mentally sound from the neck up, wouldn't that be a disconnect? Similarly, wouldn't it be a disconnect if everybody suffered mental illness, but nobody had heart disease or cancer or diabetes from the neck down? So the body works in total. It's not from the neck down or the neck up. It doesn't surprise us that there's an increase in mental issues around the world because there's also an increase in physical issues around the world. Facing the answer in one thing, they're trying to find the answer from a reductionistic perspective, which is, which is Western medicine's tendency. What's causing this? Is it the parabens? You know, is it the chemicals? Is it the mercury? Is it the vaccines? Is it the food? Is it the lack of exercise? Yeah. But it's not. It's all of those. It's, the, it's a, it's a multifactorial problem. It's, it's not one issue. It's true. There's no one issue that causes these problems. There, there's multiple issues all interfacing. It's true. It's true. Well, what are the treatments you recommend, you know, with your clinic is whole food plant-based. What are the benefits of, of this lifestyle? Well, that's true. But understand as well that whole food plant-based is one spoke in the wheel of health. It's like I said last year at the NHA conference that your health is an orchestra. And there's four sections to it. I'm not sure if you heard that lecture last year. And one of those sections, of course, is nutrition. But I see a lot of people on good nutrition who are sick. So my clinic is not simply a whole food plant-based clinic. It's one spoke in that wheel. Mm -hmm. You need all the rest. You need the other biological needs fulfilled. Otherwise, you end up unwell. You have to attend to all of your needs. As Alec Burton said many decades ago, the most important part of a healthy lifestyle is the one that's missing. Ah, that's a good point. That is. Yep. That is. So give us, a, for, for the people who weren't at the conference last year, and oh, by the way, that did get recorded, and it is up on uh, actually my YouTube channel. So I recorded it for, last year we live streamed it. This year it's professionally recorded, so much better quality. But for those of us who didn't see it, what are the four, the four pillars that you're talking about? Well, those pillars are widely known now, even in lifestyle medicine. You know, you've got to attend to the uh, nutrition, your exercise, your sleep, and your mental approach to life. You've got to attend to all of those. You, you can't ignore one. You do so at your peril because they're all critically important. You know, sleep deprivation. There's a, a book out called um, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. It's a great book and it's cutting edge research on what happens when you deprive your body of regular good quality sleep. And it impacts every system in your body, every system. And no matter how well you eat, you, are still, you will still suffer if you don't attend to that. And similarly, with, with exercise, you have to attend to those needs of movement in your life. But as I said at the NHA conference last weekend, those biological needs have to, have to be applied appropriately. 
And that word is so important. We aren't rats in a rat cage that need to be fed the same amount of chow every day and, and run on this treadmill the same amount every day. We are individuals. As Alec used to teach me, we are unique, just like everybody else, <laughs> which is a funny statement. Because, you know, your needs for, for nutrition are different to Dawn's. Right. My needs for exercise are different to Alan Goldhammer's. And I need to tap into what my needs are and that is the application, the proper application and the appropriate application of that biological need. Going back in the day, 60, 70, 80 years back, when hygiene was being really brought together in one movement by the great Dr. Herbert Shelton, the hygienist would say that there are two basic needs. We, we have a need which is relevant to every single living person on earth, but then we have the capacity, which is different with every living person on earth. For example, we have a need for exercise. We have, everyone has a need for movement. If you don't move, you are going to suffer. That's why they roll people over in bed when they're comatose. They've got to try some movement. Movement starts in the womb. And so we need to move, right? We have a need for movement. Every single living thing has a need for movement, including humans, of course. But how that movement becomes relevant to each individual is what we call our capacity. Your capacity for exercise, Gene, is different to mine because I've been exercising all my life and if I took you for a game of tennis for two hours, you might struggle. You're going to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> You'll kill but Joel me. And I, Joel and I can play tennis for two hours, singles, running around like madmen, and yet the average person would find they would fall apart because it's not appropriately applied. True. So we have needs and capacities in natural hygiene. Well, I, those... my game is racquetball, not tennis. So there you go. I like, so racquetball, the ball comes back to me at any point. I just have to w move a couple feet. Yeah. Good one. So I like that a lot better because when I played tennis, once upon a time, I kept chasing the ball. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 No, not going to happen anymore. I yeah. like the court where I can just walk over five feet and get the ball. So that's my game. So share some of your favorite success stories. I love hearing these, like people that you've helped treat. What's some of your favorite ones, Greg? Well, there's a lot. And to pluck a few out, well, we've had patients with you know, multiple sclerosis. One lady in particular, you know, going back about 11, 12 years, she couldn't walk properly due to her progression of MS. She was dragging her feet. She had foot drop and she was on interferon injections every second day. She was 46 years of age and the specialist and neurologist had told her to, be, to expect to be in a wheelchair by the age of 50. There was no comeback for her. Well, she changed her diet and she made some good improvements within three weeks. That's what I say, the 21 day window to help really flush the, the, the muck out of the body through, through, through better nutrition. And she did well, but she came back and she still had a lot of numbness in the legs. She still had slight foot drop. Mind you, she had improved significantly. And then she went and fasted for 28 days. And when we did the conference six months later, she ran from the back of the room to the front of the room to take the microphone, microphone and talk, um, which was fantastic. You know, she changed her life completely off all medication. But nobody in the entire uh, her entire history had ever asked her what she ate. No specialist, no doctor. And that's just one case. We've had another case of rheumatoid arthritis. A, a man came to see me in 1987. John Lee, his name is. And he had severe rheumatoid arthritis. He couldn't run or walk properly. He couldn't even shake my hand. He was 42 years old in 1987. I've got his record card here still. And John changed his diet. Again, he fasted for about 30 days. And now John is 73 years of age and has just run his fourth Hawaiian tri-marathon. Oh, wow. That's yeah. awesome. That yeah. is awesome. How about you, John? Do you have some favorite stories? Look, nothing really comes to mind, but I'm always amazed at the, uh, the stories of the, the children who make Babies, toddlers, children who make 
recoveries. And it's such a shame initially to see the unnecessary suffering that these poor children go through. And it's only because their parents are just not aware, they're not educated. And they come here and, you know, we'll go through their diet and lifestyle and we hear what the parents are feeding the children and, and the way the children are suffering. Fortunately, with aware, some aware parents, they're willing to make dietary change and it's incredible how quickly the children respond. And they've gone from snuffly, you know, asthmatic, bronchial kids to normal functioning children and it's all it has been mostly is a change of diet. It's that simple. And, you know, it's a shame because the children, they don't know any different. They're really the poor innocent victims in a way. And once the parents sort of become more aware, make the changes, they then implement it through the, throughout the family and, and throughout the family to encourage the other children to make change and the whole family can change and, and improve their lifestyle. And it's really lovely to see. It is. It, when you see these changes and happening and when you see somebody that goes, and even as, like as, as little as 10 days, to see yes. some changes. It's just a magnificent. Yes. It's Dr. Dean Ornish, you've heard of him, Jean. Oh, yes. Of course. Dr. Dean Ornish has shown now that it only takes 48 hours to start to change your genetics. 48 hours to start to change your gene expression. So you don't actually change the gene, but you do change its ability to express itself. So what happens within 48 hours you start up-regulating positive genes and down-regulating negative oncogenes, which tend to cause cancer. And this happens within two days on a change of diet. We're not talking fasting. We're talking just a change of diet. So you can change your genetic expression within 48 hours by changing one's food. And then, of course, he's shown that other things kick in, like meditation, moderate regular exercise, a positive outlook, and all of these things, again, work synergistically to upregulate good genes and downregulate bad genes. And that's been shown now by Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine about five or six years ago with her study on telomeres, which were the ends of chromosomes and the enzyme telomerase, which tends to negate the negative effects of lifestyle on those telomeres and so she's been awarded the Nobel Prize for that and he's been working with her Dr. Dean Ornish. It works, it's worthwhile impressing too upon the listeners that a lot of the emphasis in the application of plant-based diets and fasting is on chronic disease such as heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, autoimmune illnesses etc, diabetes, metabolic syndrome you know glucose problems, etc., etc. But as I said at the conference the other day on my last talk, I'm not sure if you were there or heard that one, I spoke on the application of hygienic measures to, to acute illnesses, infections, appendicitis, tonsillitis, where people have been, you know, mooted for surgery, but when they do nothing intelligently and have nothing by way of mouth and complete bed rest, you can turn many of these things around. In fact, that's how Dr. Alec Burton became involved in natural hygiene and why he actually left modern medicine after studying for three years. He was a, a medical student in third year when he contracted severe appendicitis and was scheduled for surgery the next day. And then a naturopath came to his bed, a friend of his father's and said, look, Alec, you don't have to have this surgery. And Alec said, well, I'm a, I'm a third year medical student. I could die. I could rupture. He said, well, it won't rupture if you don't eat a thing and just lie there and rest, total bed rest. Well, Alec did that, and when he passed away three or four years ago, he still had his appendix. I love the story that you told about your housekeeper. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Can you share that one? Yeah. You, do you want to share that, Dawn? No, I think you do it more colourfully than I do. <laughs> okay. Well, we lived in Borneo for six years, which is a big island. It's the third largest island in the world. It's part of Malaysia. And so we lived over there for six years. We had a very young family with us at the time. 
And we had a maid working with us for those six years. Her name was Siti, S-I-T-I. She was from Indonesia. And we treated her very well. But then, however, one day she had pain in the lower right quadrant of the abdomen. So I did the rebound test and it really was painful and she had a fever. She felt unwell. She was anorexic, which simply means lack of appetite. I said, look, Siti, it's, you've got appendicitis. You can go to hospital and have it removed or you can do what we do, which you see uh, at home. You go to bed, closed for repairs, no food. What would you like to do? And she said, oh, no, Mr. City, very scared. City, very scared of operation, Mr. City, no like knife. City, no like knife. City, no eat. City, no eat. So she went to bed for three days, at which time she was running around the place then saying, Mr. City, very hungry. City, hungry. City, want to eat. No pain, no fever. City, very hungry. So then she, we put her on some fruit, gradually broke her back into a, a good diet. And that was in the year 2003. So that's 16 years ago. She rang us about six months ago. She's still got her appendix. Is this like normal? I mean, can you like heal the appendix like this? We don't heal it. No, the body heals. Body heals. Yeah, provided it hasn't ruptured. But this is not just my opinion, Jean. If you go back and looked at Dr. John Tilden, I'm not sure if you've heard of John Tilden, T-I-L-D-E-N. Dr. John Tilden was one of the greats of natural hygiene. And he wrote a book called Appendicitis. It's, I've got it in my library. And he's got dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of people recovering from severe appendicitis, provided, A, it wasn't rupturing, which is, you, you know it's with ruptures, you, you're in big trouble there. You're going to be very, very profoundly unwell. There's no way you're going to lie in bed. You'll be rushed to surgery. And then provided the second pr pr provision is that the person takes no food by mouth, no medications, and does nothing in the way of activity. They lie in bed. So what does the body do? In the absence of activity and use, using of energy, what does that energy get used for? To yeah. calm the inflammation down, because that's what appendicitis is. Anything ending in ITIS denotes inflammation. Appendicitis is simply inflammation of the appendix. Tonsillitis is simply inflammation of the tonsils. Nephritis is simply inflammation of the kidneys. So in the absence of food, in the absence of expending energy on exercising and commitments, going to work, that energy, that internal energy is diverted to healing things and the first thing the body wants to do is to calm the inflammation down. Mm. So the inflammatory processes become nullified. There's no more need for them. Wow. It's so profound. I mean, so we've been talking about fasting. What is it? What's fasting? Well, fasting is the complete and voluntary abstinence of, of, from all food excepting water. Mm -hmm. So there's no tea fast, coffee fast, juice fast, watermelon fast, you know, goat milk fast. No, no. There's just fasting. All the rest, incarnations of that. Uh -huh. And fasting is the absence of all food. Why is it so important not to eat at all? And that includes juices. Is because it, even to digest juices requires internal energy. All digestion is governed by what we call active transport at the cellular level. That activity requires energy. So when you're not having anything by mouth, except maybe a little bit of water when you're dry or thirsty, there's no energy needed for digestion, assimilation, appropriation of food, etc. Metabolism slows down, energy saved. And that energy is then shifted to where the body needs it, which is in healing it, fixing things up that have been wrong. Mm -hmm. That's why often people will vomit when they fast. The body's actually evicting it. That's why we call that an eviction notice. Getting rid of a bad tenant who doesn't pay any rent. Get rid of it. So the fasting doesn't do anything. Fasting is not a cure. This is another mistake that's commonly believed by the average person. I always share with people, fasting is not a cure. How can doing nothing be a cure? You're not doing anything. You're taking nothing, doing nothing. So how does that cure you? Well, fasting doesn't cure you. All that the body does is in the absence of expending energy, 
that energy is transferred to areas of the body that need to be corrected. That is the remedy. That's the area. The body does it. Wow. Fasting doesn't do it. Just fasting allows the body to do it. Well, can fasting damage the body in any way? Of course. The, you know, the poor application of any hygienic measure can be damaging. You can have too much exercise, as Dawn did, and she got pneumonia. Irrespective of a good diet, too much fasting can kill you. You can die because that then enters a stage of starvation. Because fasting is, remember, the voluntary and complete abstinence of uh, food, excepting water, while nutritive reserves remain adequate. In other words, while your nutritive reserves remain adequate for normal metabolism and functioning. Now, if you keep going like Bobby Sands did in the late 70s in Ireland when he went on the hunger strike, and you go into day 70, you can enter the stage of starvation, which is preceded by an increase in pre-mortal nitrogen excretion. So your, your urine starts to excrete more nitrogen, which is protein breakdown. And you're entering a dangerous stage. You're entering the stage of starvation. Mm -hmm. So you can take it too far and you, can do, and you can misapply fasting. Fasting should not be done under certain circumstances because, again, it's not the appropriate application of that. But by and large, there's more areas that need it than don't need it. Right. Mm. Well, what about like electrolytes? I mean, is this an issue when you fast, things like that? No. By and large, not at all. I didn't know any... Issues over electrolytes with Alec Burton. He fasted 45,000 patients. I fasted hundreds and hundreds. And no, never had an issue with electrolytes. But I'm not saying that doesn't happen on the occasion. Mm -hmm. You might get someone with kidney damage who fasts and ends up with electrolytes. I just haven't seen it. But okay. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm sure with kidney problems, you would get some electrolyte involvement but I've never fasted anyone with any sort of kidney failure and I won't do it. Right. Right. Well, what's the difference between a juice fast? Cause you've heard about that and water fasting. Well, a juice fast should be called a juice diet. It shouldn't be called fasting. There's a, a place for juices. I know Dr. Goldhammer has juices at times with patients and that's fine. I've even done it here. But overall, if the person can do water fasting, it's far more efficacious, which mm -hmm. means effective. Because again, there's more energy for the body. Okay. Whereas juicing, you, you can have you know, 2,000 calories a day when you have four or five juices, big glasses of juice, pure juice. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of calories coming in to that. Okay. Uh, yeah, juicing can be appropriate for certain people who are scared of water fasting, who really maybe can't do a water fast because they can't take time off work, they may be able to do two or three days on juices and still function, go to work and so on, and they'll still get a reasonably good benefit from that. Well, is there a health situation where you wouldn't recommend fasting? Oh, yes, of course. You know, you're not going to recommend fasting where there's a morbid fear of fasting. So anyone that comes to me and they're fearful of it, They've got these preconceived ideas which dominate their thinking. They're what we call a contraindication number one. You don't even go there. Mm -hmm. They've got really negative relatives, you know, and they're going to fast at home. It's not ideal. I don't go there. Because I don't, I've got no fasting clinic, you see. I fast people who live nearby me, who I go to their house and supervise. And I'll take their, their blood there, their urine there but they've got to have supportive environment. Without that, it's very counterproductive. And then you've got the physical problems that you wouldn't. I would not fast a pregnant woman, even though Dawn fasted for 10 days when she was pregnant with our first child, Emily, 28 years ago, but she didn't know she was pr pregnant. Oh. And she wasn't feeling well. She had morning sickness. She went 10 days on water and gave birth to a very healthy baby. Emily's in beautiful health at 28 years of age. But that's something that I wouldn't make a habit of. I certainly wouldn't recommend a breastfeeding, a lactating woman fast, and I wouldn't recommend a pregnant woman fast. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend someone with advanced cancer fasts. I wouldn't recommend with pulmonary tuberculosis fasts. So extremes. Absolutely, yeah. You've got to be, it's got to be appropriate. They've got to be what they call a candidate. 
And most people are candidates, but there are some that you don't want to do that to. And there's also the legal implications, Jean, because today the legal implications are so much more strict than they were 50, 60 years ago. The medical profession, the government, they're after things like this that go wrong and you've got when you've got a, an extreme case of, of poor health you have a greater chance of running into trouble with the fast in which case you then involve yourself legally mm. it's so, so sad. sad it's sad it's very very sad yeah mm. it does well it seems counterintuitive that you deprive the body for a fuel for such a long time how does the body handle this easily the body has adaptive mechanisms, which if you want to go, if any of your listeners want to go and hear more about this, Dr. Alan Goldham has got some wonderful lectures on fasting, and he goes into the actual biochemistry of it. You know, the first little while you're breaking down glycogen. So when you don't eat, have nothing, then for the first 12, 20 hours of not eating, your body will break down glycogen, which is a stored form of glucose in the liver and the muscles, into fuel for the brain, fuel for the body. But that only lasts a short period of time. And then the body adapts the second stage. There's a second stage of adaptation called gluconeogenesis, where the body will break down protein into glucose, which lasts a while. Mm -hmm. And then you move into the other stage later on called ketosis, where your body then says, no, we can't keep breaking protein down because that's necessary. Your muscles are necessary. We'll move into the next stage, which is ketosis where your body then uses fat as its main fuel. And that can go on indefinitely. So your body has these inbuilt adaptations because of history. There were times in man's history where we didn't have food. And if he, did, if he went with two or three days without food and died, it would be a biological disadvantage. So there's this inbuilt adaptation within every human being to go a long period of time without food. And they can survive very, very well, thank you. How, what's the longest fast that you've had your patients undergo? The longest fast we ever saw in my clinic at home was 47 days. Yeah, the longest fast Alec Burt never conducted, which I did not see, but I only heard about this from many people, was 103 days. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That would be a lot of weight loss. He was obese with lung cancer, which was terminal, and... He just kept fasting and fasting and fasting. And I, from last I heard, he, he, was, he lived 20 years. Wow. Wow. Well, why is it important? Like you said, you go and visit your patients that are doing water fast. Why is it important to, to do this under the supervision of a doctor? Well, because you're entering an unknown territory for the person. And you need lots of counselling. Mm -hmm. Even on Facebook just yesterday, Sandra, Sandra was fasting. I'm not sure. Yeah, yes, yeah. she's down in Puerto Rico fasting. Yeah, yeah. And here she's on day two of the fast. And, you know, she's panicking, thinking, what's going on? I've got a headache. I've got a caffeine withdrawal headache. I feel terrible. Now, if you haven't got someone with experience yeah. that can, can, can calm you down and say, look, this is the body working as designed, then you start to worry and that worry then feeds on itself and you could get sick, real sick. So you do need, this is a specialized area, fasting specialized. It's nothing you just do for a period of time and then you break the fast and go. You need expert supervision with this, particularly if it's a longer fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, other than animal-based foods, I mean, what, what foods should you maybe avoid you know, while you're going into the fast and then coming out of the fast? Well, of course, you want to avoid processed foods, you know, refined sugar, refined flour, refined rice, white rice, white flour, white sugar. You want to avoid processed food, biscuits, lollies, chips, soft drinks, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, oh. cordials, tea, coffee, alcohol, tobacco, all of these social poisons and these stimulants we want to get them out of the diet. And that's before we even touch the meat, dairy, and chicken and fish and eggs. My first recommendation for people who come to see me is not to go vegan unless they're dying. That's a different matter altogether because they've got very, very little wiggle room. 
But someone who's coming in and they're unwell, but they're not faced with a, a, a life-threatening prognosis, the first thing I recommend is they stop stimulating themselves. They stop this incessant stimulation day in, day out, the coffee, the tea, the alcohol. It just goes on and on. And caffeine is one of the most underappreciated causes of ill health. You know, people focus on what they eat and they then almost give car blanche to how much coffee and tea you drink. No, that's not a problem. That's not true. Well, I don't think people understand that caffeine has a half-life. It's not that true. And yeah, so a cup of coffee you have at eight o'clock in the morning, at two o'clock in the afternoon, you still got 50% of the caffeine in your body. Correct. And eight o'clock of that night, you still have 25%. Correct. And at two o'clock in the morning, it's 12.5% that's Correct. still stimulating you from that cup of coffee you had at eight o'clock in the morning. Absolutely. Very true. And not only that, Jean, but the half-life can go up to 11 hours in caffeine really? with pregnant women, my word. So they, they have a different half-life. The half-life will vary from individual to individual, but individual to individual, but you're right, on average, it's about six hours. So what's the difference between fasting and intermittent fasting? Well, intermittent fasting is really intermittent feeding. Okay. <laughs> I like so, that. You know, That's good. You're, you're, you're just going on uh, having a short period of time without eating. And they call it intermittent fasting, but really it's intermittent feeding. And it has okay. a benefit, no doubt about that. But it doesn't have the same efficacious benefits of a, of a water-only fast. So what are the benefits okay. as, you know, doing intermittent fasting? What are the benefits? Plenty. In that you're going to reduce the time that your body's digesting food for a start. And that's been proven now with studies that if you go a window, we call it window eating, where you restrict yourself to a certain window during the day of eating, which is a form of intermittent fasting, you're giving your body a chance to detoxify. And Dr. Furman, he elaborates this beautifully in his great book, Eat to Live, mm. where he talks about you know, the, the concepts of anabolism and catabolism. The body, when you eat, is building up. That's anabolic, like in anabolic steroids, mm -hmm. building up. The body's building itself. It's building its tissues up. Now, when it's building up, it's not breaking down. So you're not going to detoxify very much when you're building up. So the more you eat, the less you break down bad tissue. So when you don't eat for a period of time, which is intermittent fasting, you are employing that stage in that process called catabolism, catabolic stage of metabolism. And that is where you're breaking down old tissue and de dying tissue, cancer cells, worn out cells, senescent cells. They call that apoptosis, the death of old cells. And so when you're in the, the catabolic stage, you actually upregulate the process of apoptosis of breaking down cells that are only getting in the way in your health. They should be eliminated, broken down and excreted and detoxified. And so that process of detoxification and elimination is potentiated when you undergo catabolic metabolism, when you're not eating. So the benefits of intermittent fasting are you're extending the catabolic stage of metabolism, which is very good for your health because it keeps you cleaner. Wow. Well, you've talked a little bit about detox. What happens as you start to go undergo fasting or intermittent fasting? These toxins are coming out. How do you deal with that? Well, as, as Sandra's experiencing now in Asa Frey and Joanna Frey's clinic, she's feeling not too, not too happy um, and a bit sorry for herself. She's having a little bit of a pity party because sometimes the movement of those toxins is painful. And that's why when you're getting better, you often feel worse. When you stop the detoxification, you'll feel better, but you're actually getting worse because the toxins remain inside the body. So when you're undergoing a detoxification, you're stopping the coffee, the tea, the alcohol, and you're cleaning up your act and getting off all these stimulants, and, and focusing on the word desistance more than assistance. The body then has the energy to detoxify, opens up all the different pathways of detoxification. 
Now, when those toxins start to move out into the uh, extracellular fluids and into the pathways of, of uh, excretion, they become painful and they can hurt and they can make you feel unpleasant and make your moods change. But once they're out, you feel much better. It's like a heroin addict. When they're stopped, when they're on heroin, they don't feel that bad because the body's retaining the toxic residues inside the body. When they stop heroin, which is a very, very a well-explained thing when you see the movie Walk the Line of about 10, 15 years back about Johnny Cash, who was an addict. When he stopped, he was hospitalised for a month because he was undergoing detoxification and he was in terrific pain, you know, terrible pain. Same as Robbie Williams, the famous singer. He was drinking 40 cups of coffee a day. And when he stopped, he had to be institutionalised because the pain and the withdrawal symptoms, but once the body had gotten rid of those noxious stimulants and those corrosive stimulants, he felt great. So what are some things that you can do to help with the pain or the toxins coming out? Oh, well, again, we would recommend the person just goes to bed and stays there and has maybe a hot compress to the, or a warm compress or a cool compress, whichever they find relieving relieving measures like that on the body, on the, on the neck, on the forehead, they're okay. But we don't recommend stopping those part, the pain with anti-inflammatory uh, pills or painkillers because you don't want to add more toxins to the body. So sometimes you've just got to go through it. Yeah. You know, I'll never forget, we had one lady come in, she, she was 67 years of age, and she had major, major health issues. She was obese. She had diabetes, she had arthritis, and she had very, very high blood pressure. Anyway, uh, the worst thing she had was these intractable migraine headaches. And when she came to see me, and Dawn remembers this case vividly, mm. her name was Hilda. Yep. And Hilda came in and, and she couldn't open her eyes because her husband was holding her by the hand and, and taking her through into my clinic because the light would make her migraines worse. She had migraines every day for 20 years. <sighs> Every day. Oh. And so she couldn't walk in the light because the migraines would become exacerbated through the light. And she was a walking time bomb. And so she went she fasted for 30 days. And for the first five days of that fast, she relayed later to Dawn and I that she wanted to die because she never stopped vomiting. So for five days, the nurses brought buckets in and she would fill the buckets with vomit coming from the gallbladder, the, the bile from the stomach and the intestines, the toxic mm. residues which were being cleaned out of the, out of the system. And, and she had these intractable, pounding headaches for five days, just like she had for 20 years. No medications. They took her off every medication. When she came in to see us, she lost 60 pounds in weight after six weeks. And she had no high blood pressure, no diabetes, no joint pain. And most importantly, she had no headaches for the first time in 20 years. And she did a little dance in my clinic in the waiting room to show me how well she was. But she suffered. Yeah. Stop the abuse. I mean, is there anything like some chamomile tea to help flush out some, you know, hydration? Is there... You're fasting. You don't want chamomile tea because it contains active ingredients which your body has to then cope with. Mm. So you don't want to do that. Now, if the person is freaking out, you, you may have to make some modifications to that and maybe break the fast, mm -hmm. maybe. In which case their pain will subside. Why? Because the toxins have retained themselves inside the body. They've been contained. They're not moving anymore. So the person will feel better, but unfortunately they're really getting worse how about maybe like essential oils to like maybe calm the system or again you know, you're not ingesting them you're well, smelling you are them. absorbing them you are mm. absorbing them transdermally if you put them on your skin or if you breathe them in you do get those molecules into the bloodstream okay either through transdermal absorption across the skin across the dermis right. or through the nostrils so you're trying to, to, to really let the body take care of itself. And that can be very unpleasant. As Ali, Alan Goldhammer said at the conference, it can be a miserable experience fasting. Mm -hmm. It can be mm -hmm. miserable. Yeah. Yep. I know. I've done it many, many, many times and I felt miserable. Yeah. yeah. 
I, yeah. It's like when I go up to the Cape, that's when I, that's when I do it. And I'm by myself and I, I'm not around food. There's nothing in the refrigerator, you know, that's it. I am just by myself, hold up. We're not, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to be around anybody and I'm sure no one wants to be around me when I'm doing, going through this because it's sure. not fun. Oh, wow. No way. No. Well, John, you raised a plant-based family. W was this mm -hmm. easy? Look, it, it's never easy because you're the minority. Um, a lot of, even though a lot of our friends are reasonably health conscious. And of course, you've got family members, other, you know, grandparents and aunties and uncles and people who are very well meaning, but they often, you know, try to kill your, your children with kindness by sabotaging the diet. So we had to make it very clear right from the beginning what our children could and couldn't eat when they were out with their grandparents. And most of the time they they were pretty compliant with that. You know, they stuck with it, which was great. But it, look, it's not easy because there's a lot of influence out there. And it's, you know, it's not, it's not great influence. And especially when they start socialising with people who are brought up very, very conventionally. And you know that they're going to make poor decisions at times as they get older, especially when they start going to school. Yeah. But we just sort of thought, well, okay, as long as we can sort of keep them on the straight and narrow at home, they eat whatever is in our house and nothing else. And when they go out socialising with other families and children and birthday parties and things like that, well, it's up to them to make their own choices. But I think... Looking back, I mean, our children are in their 20s now and I think the foundations we created for them were fairly solid because, you know, even now they tend to, when they're unwell or, or just feeling a bit untowards, they, they tend to go back to eating very, very simply. So I believe that it has had an effect on them. If they do, like, deviate, like at a party or something like that, they have some pizza... Do they feel it when they come home? Hang on. I'll answer that, Jen, because Dawn's got the phone there. Okay. Yeah. See, our two boys, 25 and 21, are not plant-based. They still eat meat. Okay. They still eat meat. They still have a, a wide diet. Now, their diet does contain a lot of vegetables and fruits. But see, I ate meat at 21. I can't impose my views on them. They're their own bosses. Our daughter's 28, she's a vegan. She's a dietitian, she's marrying a doctor, a medical doctor who's a vegan as well. She's right on board. She's a chip off the old block. But the two boys, they're running their own journey. But what we've taught them, Jean, is that they know that what they're doing to themselves is not that healthy. They know that. But they're young, and you know what it's like when you're 21, 25, you think you're going to live forever. And, you know, you, 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 you can't talk sense often to a 25-year-old male or a 21-year-old male. But we've taught them, when they get sick, don't compound the problem by suppressing the acute symptoms. So if ever they get sick, which is not often, they're very fit, which is good. They're very fit, very strong, very robust. They're not sickly. There are no medications. They've never taken medications. Um, they know to go to bed. So if, they've, they've learned that at least, to respect their body and to have an empowerment that they feel empowered. They know that if they feel rubbish, it's because of what they've done to themselves. Yeah. And they'll go to bed and they won't eat a thing and they'll get better. So we have given them that empowerment, that wisdom. Right. Now, whether they go and follow the way we are, who knows? I don't know. They run their own lives. They're, they're adults. All we can do is show them the way with our, with our actions. As I've always said, your footprints speak louder than your lips. Mm. It's true. It's true. Yep. Well, That's right. Did they, do they ever notice like any changes or deviations? Because you raised them plant-based, right? No. We raised no? them with... No, they still have a bit of fish and chicken being raised. Okay. A little bit of fish. Put it this way, they were more nutritarian. 
Okay. Because if you look at the book, Eat to Live, and, and Dr. Furman's mentioned this often, whether you have a little bit of animal protein is largely inconsequential as long as the vast bulk of your food comes from plant-based. Mm -hmm. Now, you can argue that, you know, 100% vegan has got extra health benefits and you, you probably would be right. But we raised our kids with a, a very, very plant-based diet, but with some animal protein. They liked it, particularly the two boys, and they had a little bit. But they've been great health. The, the children are in fantastic health. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I was going to say, but they we didn't have a lot of the refined carbs and nah. you know sweets and lollies and all that sort of stuff. We never had that stuff in the house, so it was there was always a very high plant based diet, fruits and vegetables. That's basically what they lived on up until the age of about two years old, especially where as they were being breastfed. We we just never had the rubbish in the house the way most people did. Mm -hmm. No, no, there's no caffeine in the house. There's no alcohol in the house. There's no soft drinks in the house. There's none of that stuff. None of that refined rubbish and stimulants. So, yeah, our, our kids have never seen Dawn and I drink alcohol, not one glass, ever. We're, they've never seen us drink a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, ever. We don't have it in the house. So we're showing the way. We can't impose that on the boys. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. They have to make their own decision. They yeah. do. They do. Well, do you have children, Jean, yourself? I have two. I have two. Yeah. And it's interesting. My daughter uh, was older and stayed with my sister when I got married. I got married 10 years ago. And my son stayed with me. And he was a wrestler. I mean, he was in football, wrestling, and rugby. Nice, genteel sports, you know. And I saw – one of the things I saw him, because in from his freshman to his sophomore year – we were transitioning to plant-based living. And one of the things that I would see consistently in wrestling is, because as the day goes by, you're in these tournaments that go on forever. And as you go through the day, you're wrestling better and better and better candidates until you get the first and second place wrestling, third, fourth wrestling, fifth, sixth wrestling. So I would never see him do this. And I would see his com you know, competition because all day long, you would hear, oh, pizza has been delivered. And the boys would go, Vroom. and they were eating pizza. And my son, when we were in his sophomore year, I mean, I always brought coolers, you know, and I would never give him money for food because I'm not mm. that crap. So mm. we always brought our own food. So, and when we started going plant-based, it was all, you know, good plant-based, you know, nutrition and food. And as soon as he'd wrestle, then I'd give him foods and, you know, to get ready for the next round. And one of the things I would see his competitors doing is one of the tricks and the strategies is to get out of the ring so that they reset you and bring you back. But that gives you about 10 seconds to get your breath back. And I would constantly see his competition going like this and just putting their arms over their head, you know, kind of like expanded their, and they would do it intrinsically. They didn't know they're doing this. I mean, their chest would be just heaving, you know, it's so, so rigorous in, in terms of that. And I never saw my son do that. I never saw him like his chest heaving because he, he was not eating the cheese and all the other garbage that was clogging his arteries so his blood could flow, he could carry the oxygen. And he did yeah. quite well, you know, in that. And, you know, just to see that, that whole process in, in the wrestling uh, competition, he did extremely well. And I attribute a lot of that to, his, I mean, first of all, he was good. He, was, he, he wrestled very well. But mm. having the fuel to be able to do that, I mean, his technique was good but having the body to be able to carry the oxygen, the nutrients and, and that to it. But, and yeah. I also, I also attribute like my daughter, I'm, I'm hundred percent. She is lactose intolerant. And I think because I was giving them and I didn't know any better at the time I was, you know, raising my children the way my parents raised me and giving them lots mm -hmm. of, of milk and animal products. And she was constantly sick with like asthma and, and, you know, antibiotics all the time because she was all the time sick. 
And then she developed vitiligo. And I really attribute that to the, to the dairy. And I, yeah. I mm-hmm. will live with that for the rest of my life, you know, that, that I did that to my own kid. And well, you can't blame yourself, though. You didn't I, know I any know. better. I know, but I do now. And, you know, and I see this within my family. My family is, is entirely obese. I'm the only nutcase that has broken away. <laughs> and, you know, and they look at me, oh, yeah, there she comes, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> what do you, would you bring some grass today? How about some tree bark? Oh, I saved that for special occasions, you know. <laughs> but, you know, and, I, and, I, and you can't talk to my family. And, and they, don't, they see the changes in me. I mean, out of five siblings, four of us are on sleep pap. Let's guess who is not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I've seen a lot of changes myself, but, you know, within my family, they are resistant. And we're starting to see, you know, big family, you know, issues in my family, cancer already and going through. And, you know, I've had conversations with them and it's... And, no, no, my, my cancer specialist is one of the top in the country. And it's like, okay, it's not going to be pleasant what you're going to be doing. I mean, I think at that point, I'd rather be doing a fast than, you know, than undergoing surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. I mean, I just, I, you know, I just look at this and just go, you know, it just makes me crazy. I mean, I, my, myself, I've lost at this point over 100 pounds. I have, I mean, I still have more to go without question, but my fat and I, we've been together for a long time and it does not want to give up the mothership without question. (laughs) You know, it's, 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 you know, it's wow. Even like caloric density and all this other stuff. So, you know, I still work at it. It's, it's, it's real and food addiction. I know Neil at the conference, he was talking about that gene. That's my family, you know, Uh (laughs) that he was talking about. I would be willing to bet a year's salary if you tested my both sides of my family. That's it for us. Because we don't have, there's no gambling in our family. There's no drug addictions. I mean, we all went through a period of smoking at one point when it was cool, you know, back in the day. But we all quit, I mean, right away, you know, within a very short period of time after that. And, you know, so there's no been, you know, drug addiction, gambling, you know, alcohol, nothing like that, but food. Oh, wow. I mean, every family gathering is like, who can bring the most caloric dense, dense food, you know, mm. that's going to go light up your brain and ding, 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 ding. And, mm. and I even noticed myself, like my husband, my husband had multiple sclerosis and he's reversed it, you know, and I reversed high blood pressure healed my thyroid, which my doctor looked at me and said, you're going to be on this medication. Because I remember her to this day writing out the prescription for the synthetic thyroid. And, and I just, she circled four, four refills. And I'm like, how, how long am I going to be on this? And she just looked at me and said, for the rest of your life. And I said, no. She's like, yeah, it, I've never seen the thyroid heal. Until now. So... <laughs> You know, and it's interesting, and, and I actually was having a discussion with, with Dr. Barnard about it because once I started going plant-based, I started releasing a lot of toxins. I mean, I had 100 pounds of fat on me there, you know, that was carrying a lot of these toxins. And so it started to, to make my thyroid go wonky. And that's when she, you know, it, the, the TSA, TSH was starting to get high. And so she put me on the synthetic thyroid, which was the normal protocol for most doctors. But as I started to go plant-based and cleaned out my system, my thyroid started to regulate itself and heal itself. And then she took me off and her response was, it was probably bad blood test. Unbelievable. Because I don't get any credit. You know, now she knows a little yeah. bit better, and, but I didn't get any credit for it at all. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's how it is. But it is. I mean, it's, it's incredible the transition and the changes that you see and the amount of energy that you have when you get rid of the weight, you get rid of the toxins. It's absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So it's been such a delight talking to you guys. You guys are like a plethora of information. And I just love, I have to say, Dr. Fitzgerald, your presentations at the conference, 
and by the way, I just have to put a shout out to the National Health Association. You know, their conference is amazing. Yes. And they are, they recorded this professionally this year instead of me standing in the back streaming it with my cell phone. But they mm -hmm. recorded it professionally and these guys did a super job and it was just released and you can get conference, the conference for $99. So absolutely phenomenal. If you're not part of the NHA, I can't say enough about it. The membership is only $35 and they've got a, for a magazine that comes out four times a year that has nothing but living the NHA way, whole food plant-based. And yeah. articles, you've written quite a few. And, you know, there's just so many, there's no advertising. It's an incredible oh. magazine that is just super well done. So, Best in the world. I'm Best sorry? Best in the world. It is. It is. Oh, yeah. With your membership, you also get back issues. You can log in to the, you know, back side of the website and you have 18 years of the magazine that you can pull up and read at your leisure uh, okay. when you're fasting. Mm. Ah, okay. Well, that's <laughs> there great. You go. Well, thank right, you so Jenny. much. It's been an absolute delight talking with you. And uh, so thank you again for coming in. Thank you, Jen. Thank and look after yourself. We'll see you again sometime in the future for sure. Thank you. Well, probably thank at the you. next NHA conference. That's right. Yeah. Okay. See you later. Bye now. Bye.